Hello, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, everybody, wherever you might be. It is my pleasure to welcome Walter van Seilekom from the Radboud University, so the Netherlands. And he will tell us everything and more about non commutative spaces, but on that finite resolution. The floor is yours. Take it away. Thank you. So it's exactly at finite resolution that we're after. So this is great. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, it's a great pleasure to give this talk. So thanks for the invitation. I would have loved to, to be here more often on the Wednesday evenings, but this is typically rush hour. Yeah. <laughs> so I hope uh, the kids will stay calm downstairs so I can sit here and do some uh, this presentation. Yeah, so this is a uh, work uh, based on essentially two papers that I wrote in the last few years with Alain Kohn. And it's kind of um, based on the idea whether you could um, still describe an, a space, an occupative space, if you only have a finite resolution or a finite part of the spectrum available. So let me try to bring this into motion. Yeah, so let's start with the uh, very basics. So basic motivation for doing spectral geometry is uh, essentially this, uh, this question or this, this phrase, this quote but here in the shape of a drum. And so this goes back to Mark Kutch. And the idea is that, um, uh, that, that you try to describe geometry, in this case, a Riemannian manifold, MG, you try to describe it with the spectrum of some operator like the Laplacian on that, uh, that manifold. Um, so you, spin geometry then allows you to consider Dirac operators as well. But the story is the same. You try to actually capture geometry as much as you can by looking at the spectrum. Of course, it's well known that uh, that one cannot really capture all of the, the geometry. There are kind of isospectral, but different shapes, very famous. Uh, and already at the time, it was known that this could never uh, work in this generality. But one can uh, improve the situation by taking into account another device, which is the Caesar algebra CM of continuous functions on M. And so if you combine these two objects, the c algebra CM with, say, the Dirac operator on this manifold uh, M, DM, then that combination allows you to actually uh, capture the geometry of M in, in, in its full glory. And one example would be this, is that if you try to, to think, how can I translate um, something like a metric, like a distance, how can I translate this from the distance between two points, X and Y, to this function space uh, continuous functions on m then you could just translate it to function values f of x and f of y as long as you allow uh, the gradient to be uh, only smaller or equal to one of that function because then you can really tilt that distance and this is precisely what the formula tells you here is so i take a supremum over functions for which the gradient is smaller or equal to one and then just take the difference and the gradient is nicely written in terms of this first order differential operator dm. And this is exactly uh, what this formula tells you that if you take that operator norm of this commutator, then uh, that captures precisely the gradient. So that's, uh, <clears throat> that's kind of, uh, well, let me summarize that again here. So if um, uh, this, uh, this, this uh, spectrum of dm uh, is combined with the Caesar algebra cm, then you can answer a catch question in the affirmative. And in fact, this combination, of course, it's, it's crucial to see how you do that combination. It's, it's not just the, the package of both, but you combine it in a certain fashion. If you take this C of M, that would act as operators on L2 of uh, L2 sections of the, of the spinner bundle on which that Dirac operator acts as an unbounded operator. Of course, this device on the left-hand side, the spectral triple, that's kind of the basic uh, ingredient for doing non commutative differential geometry. And uh, Kohn then uh, actually proved in 2008 that under suitable conditions on, say, the left hand side, uh, one can capture M, G back. Uh, so to really capture the geometry of M, including the metric structure as well as the spin structure. So that's, uh, that's the reconstruction theorem. Okay, so um, let's uh, consider then what we have. So we need this package to be able to describe geometry uh, using spectra only. So this is the kind of the spectral uh, approach to doing geometry. 
And uh, this requires that you know uh, essentially all of the eigenvalues <laughs> of the drug operator, including the way it acts on this Hilbert space. But that's really a lot of information. So uh, what we were considering, actually motivated by, by physics, is whether, <clears throat> so what happens if you uh, are restricted in uh, getting this amount of information? So for instance, if you look at the detector, you would have only a part of the energy range, so part of the eigenvalue spectrum that is available to you. Uh, and as well as some certain resolution, you cannot just kind of uh, have infinite resolution. So there's this idea that you have these uh, limits from uh, a physical standpoint. So what we're trying to develop uh, in these papers and also in the, in the coming years is to, to see what is the underlying mathematics if you try to do this spectral approach to geometry, as non-cumulative geometry does, when you only have part of the spectrum available, and alternatively, and actually dually in a certain sense, you could say that that's only kind of capturing space with a finite resolution. That's the usual duality between, uh, so given by Fourier transformation, for instance. Now, this has been uh, around. Actually, some papers were uh, already uh, written on this very kind of idea. It's D'Andrea, Francesco D'Andrea, uh, Fidele Lizzi, and Pier Martinetti. They wrote a paper in 2014 where they all kind of already kind of uh, insert this idea of, uh, of, um, of, of truncating the geometry in a certain sense. And uh, then a bit later, so Lisa Glaser uh, and Abel Stern, who's my PhD student, um, they considered uh, actually the possibility that these kind of if you if you if you're considering only only finitely many eigenvalues of a Dirac operator, it's essentially reducing functional analysis to linear algebra, and this is very conveniently done on a computer. So this is what uh, what they've been doing. They try to kind of uh, put uh, these uh, these geometries on a computer and see if you can still understand that geometry by only looking at the finite uh, part of the spectrum. And what I will be talking about today will be based on these two papers uh, which I wrote with Alain Con. So the first appeared, uh, which is actually in the spectral uh, truncation. So it's the first possibility <clears throat> that appeared in CMP, and this other one in uh, in this uh, kind of in the 100th anniversary of this journal, SIGET, just recently. All right, so let's see, uh, let's, let's make this a little bit more precise, this idea. So what I'm after is, first of all, let me um, only kind of uh, let you glance at the usual story, which were these spectral triples and now maybe a bit more general. So I take uh, an algebra A, it's actually a C-star algebra. And uh, I take a self adjoint operator D, which has compact resolvents and bounded commutators for a suitable or a certain uh, dense subalgebra. And they kind of meet these two objects uh, on the Hilbert space H. So the C structure that, that will act as bounded operators, of course, and then the self adjoint operator D will typically be unbounded to make sure that the resolvent is actually compact. Then what you can do with this data in this kind of more general setup is that you can uh, talk about states uh, on Caesar algebras. So they're positive linear functionals of norm one, and it might have extremal points. So they are the pure states of this state space. And uh, whatever you do for these states, you can describe a distance, which is given by the same formula as I had before, but now phrased uh, fully in terms of, uh, of, of this data, namely the Caesar algebra, states on the Caesar algebra, and then this sort of gradient condition of the commutator of D with A to be smaller or equal to one in operator norm. So that just tells you again that I just put the formula that I had before about the distance in terms of functions and now phrase that in terms of states. And if you take a uh, point evaluation, in that case, you would get pure states actually, and they would correspond to the, the formula before. But that's how you get this, uh, this specific case back in the commutative case. But this is what we have in general, and this will be kind of, um, we, we try to keep that formula all over the place. Whatever we do, we, we, we try to work with in, in a context where we have this, this formula available, because that gives us a notion of how to do geometry on this state spaces. Okay, so let's look at how um, this, this first possibility appears. So uh, suppose we only have part of the spectrum available of this operator D, 
Um, uh, so that means I have a spectral projection P and I project onto this, uh, so the image of that, so the range, and that will be my closed Hilbert subspace. So it's still a Hilbert space. Then I could also compress my operator D with this P, actually restrict it. It's just PD or DP, whatever. It's still a self-joint operator. And what I could also then do, or what I have to do actually, is I, this, this algebra should act on that closed Hilbert subspace, but that doesn't come naturally because it could of course map outside of this subspace. And typically it does. And that means that this, uh, that I have to kind of um, make it uh, act on that Hilbert subspace, which I do by compressing the algebra with the projection P. Uh, now that's not an algebra anymore. Uh, well, unless the projection is actually in the algebra, but that's never the case really if, if the projection is a spectral projection for D, so it's kind of different differently in the uh, in the operators on H in a, in a certain sense. I mean, the point is really that if this is not in A, then PAP is not an algebra. However, it's an operator system. And this is where kind of this, this idea of operator systems enters. And also the theory of operator systems is, is kind of entering the, 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 the fields of, uh, of, of, uh, of spectral triples, or the theory of spectral triples. Then the point is that, of course, PAP star is equal to PA star P. So you kind of keep the star structure but you lose the multiplicative structure. And that's essentially, that's the basic idea of operator systems. Okay, so that's um, one thing. So it suggests that we should replace uh, A with the operator system PAP. And let's then uh, consider the, 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 other, the other possibility of, of uh, trying to describe spaces at, uh, with a finite resolution. And for that, I will consider, um, first of all, points X and Y, I would like to, to say they're uh, equal or kind of identified when their distance is smaller than epsilon. Now, of course, that's not an equivalence relation, but it is a tolerance relation. So it's symmetric and it's uh, um, reflexive. So this uh, means that I still have something. And for instance, if you think about how you associate to an equivalence relation, uh, a Caesar algebra, by integral operators with support uh, uh, on that equivalence relation. Uh, I could try to do the same. I just look at integral uh, so kernels, uh, which have support in this relation. So our epsilon, that would be just the points X and Y in X cross X, for which the distance is smaller than epsilon. This will be made precise later on, but the point is really that this support condition on the integral kernels of course, that's, that's, is not respected by the product, the convolution product on the kernels, because that will kind of make the, the support larger and larger. So what I lose here is the multiplicative structure on these integral kernels or these integral operators. But what I keep by symmetricity is the star structure on there, because that will just kind of be, uh, for integral kernels, it would just be kind of flipping the two, the X and the Y, and putting a bar on top. So you still have this kind of set of operators which have uh, a star structure, which kind of is closed on the taking the adjoints. So that's another operator system which I'd like to describe. And uh, that will be kind of in the second part of the talk. And we'll start with the first. So for that, I'd like to uh, spend some time just uh, talking about operator systems because this has been around for, for several decades. And it's a, it's a very, elegant theory, which we, we kind of uh, happily uh, adopt. So uh, here I write Choi Efros in 77, even though I should also say that, uh, that Arveson in the 60s, I mean, it's already kind of the kind of set the, the basic ideas of these operator systems, but then for function systems essentially. But uh, here's the definition. So it's a star closed vector space uh, of bounded operators. So that's um, as simple as it can get. It's just a, a bunch of bounded operators, which is closed under the star. I would take it to be closed as well uh, in the norm topology, um, but there's no multiplications. Uh, so that's important. And then it's, uh, uh, it will be unital, at least in the first part, meaning it contains the identity operator. So this is what would be called a concrete operator system. But I will just refer to it as an operator system. 
And uh, the basic structure that it, uh, it, uh, it possesses is that it's uh, ordered. So you can talk about positive operators, of course, in the usual sense. And um, that gives a cone, E plus, inside E. And in fact, it's even more than that. It's you, what you can do is you can amplify this E to kind of matrices with values in E. And that you can let act on Hn, on n copies of the same Hilbert space. And then you can still talk about positivity for these operators. So what actually, what do you get? You don't just get an, an order structure uh, on E saying something is positive in there or something is larger than something else, but you get uh, a matrix order. So you also have these cones in the matrices M and E. Now, um, what you then would like is of course to have maps between these operator systems that, that respect that order structure. So what you think, uh, what, what are the usual uh, maps to be considered between operator systems are positive maps, first of all. And then with this matrix order, you would like to also have them map, uh, say the positive cones M and E plus to the positive cone M and F plus. So in that sense, they are completely positive. Um, <clears throat> sometimes you would consider, of course, unital operator, uh, unital completely positive maps, and there you, there you can vary, of course. Um, so isomorphisms are complete order isomorphisms, meaning that there's a completely positive map, and also the inverse, so there's an inverse, um, uh, that's also a complete order isomorphism. And in fact, uh, what, what you see here appearing is a structure which it can be formulated uh, without referring to operators. It's just a structure on a vector space uh, um, that you could have, a star vector space, where you can say, well, there is a cone of positive elements, and actually that, that positivity extends, or these cones extend to the matrices of E, which is still a vector space, and that's kind of going to, to the abstract uh, operator system. And in fact, it's possible to, and that's actually in Troy and Ephros, to realize them always as concrete operator systems as I use them here. So that will be a, a longer story, which I won't um, uh, really go into, even though here and there we will use that. On the other hand, um, my operator systems will, for which I will use that are typically finite dimensional. So that really kind of helps. So that's the idea. And now um, comes the question, okay, so I have this operator system. Can I somehow uh, see how far away it is from a, from a Caesar algebra? Um, so for instance, is there, if you kind of, well, I'm giving these bunch of operators, I just multiply them, I take linear combinations. At, at which point do I reach a Caesar algebra? Uh, for instance, B of H, or it can be smaller. So at which point do you get a subspace which is actually closed under the multiplication of operators? Now then, uh, um, Arvison introduced this idea that you could try to find the smallest one, which he called the Caesar envelope, um, for which Hamana then established existence and uniqueness in the, well, 10 years later. And even more recently, it's also kind of um, uh, achieved this result um, using uh, the, the idea of, of, of Arvison actually going back to the original ideas that he had with boundary representation. And that's Davidson and Kennedy that did that. Um, Sorry, uh, Walter, uh, I'm just uh, curious uh, why there is such a huge time span between unital and non unital case? It's 41 years. Um, that's a good question. So, actually, the, uh, the um, it's only 2002, I think, that non unital operator systems were kind of defined. Uh huh in a way that actually works in the sense that you could um, realize this abstract operator system without the units or non-unital operator system concretely on a Hilbert, uh, as operators on a Hilbert space. So that's already at uh, say 20 uh, plus years. Yeah. So then it, you, you're already kind of, uh, you're quickly there. So it's um, a lot of development is, so that's starting with Werner in 2002. Now we'll get to that in a moment. But that's uh, essentially uh, how uh, this um, progress was made. So yeah, mm. I, it's hard to say. I wasn't around yet, so I couldn't. Uh... Yes. Okay. Um, so uh, yeah, so we we needed the non-unital case, so we sat down and, and tried to see if you can do this Caesar envelopes for that. And there were a lot of developments also in the last uh, few decades in this direction. And um, 
there's another paper which also puts this into perspective of uh, actually using uh, non-commutative convex spaces. This is Kennedy, Kim, and Manor. To... May I have a question? No need to case. Yes. Uh, so this construction is uh, used in the abstract setting, yes, uh, but uh, concretely, if you have a concrete uh, operator system, this corresponds just to taking a sister envelope in the usual sense, the sister generated by, by yeah. some... So which is actually, let me show it so we can, we know what we're talking about. So what you're talking about is a sister extension, which just means that you look at the sister algebra, which is generated by your operator system. But as we will see, it, it really makes a difference how you kind of represented your operator system. And, and so what is interesting is, is you need some kind of, um, uh, so even though I introduced operator systems concretely, it's interesting to maybe see how you can change that concrete realization of the same operator system. Uh, so without losing information on the operator system, but uh, maybe there are some uh, a smaller sister algebra that it uh, generates in a, in a suitable sense. And, and that's what we're, I'm after here. So that's, uh, and, and of course, if you think about, if you're dealing with operator systems and, and in particular, you'd like to understand their structure, uh, like invariants or so on, uh, so we'll also come to, to speak about in a moment, then it's important that you uh, make sure that that notion does not depend on the way I presented my operator system. So that explains a little bit the, uh, the idea or the motivation for doing that. Okay, thank you. Right, so, uh, so the Caesar extension um, would map actually E into A, uh, A is Caesar algebra, and uh, that's actually precisely generated by the image uh, of, uh, of the Caesar, so um, of kappa E. And of, that should be a complete order isomorphism. So it should respect the structure that I have on my operator system. And um, what you're looking for is the Caesar envelope, which is, as I said, it's kind of the smallest one in the sense that any other would kind of uh, uh, would come with a projection or subjection onto that Caesar envelope. So in that sense, it's smallest. So you can just quotient out. It's actually rho is a star uh, uh, homomorphism, subjective. And uh, that would map B onto A. By the way, this is Arvison down the bottom, so at least. So here and there, I put some um, some pictures to uh, to lighten up this uh, evening session, at least uh, here in Europe. So let's try to find these Caesar envelopes. Um, so the smallest ones, and as I said, you you're trying to to kind of taking quotients. Um, of your Caesar extension uh, in, in, in kind of the maximal way. So you want to get the smallest Caesar algebra in a sense. And so for that, this uh, boundary ideal is, um, is, is, is very suitable. It's, it's, um, the idea is that you take a, in your Caesar extension A, you look for an ideal I, such that if you take the quotients, you do not lose uh, information on kappa E. So it's a completely isometry uh, this quotient map, if you restrict it to the image of E inside the Caesar algebra. So as far as E is concerned, you, we're not losing much. And we're looking for the, the largest of such ideals. And this we call the sheet of boundary ideal. And um, the, the, the reason why is that it corresponds to the sheet of boundary. And actually here and there, I would kind of freely interchange the two, where the ideal, of course, corresponds to the boundary uh, in the usual way. So then the proposition, which is essentially in uh, Hamana, is that if you take a Caesar extension, then you can find such, a, or at least there exists a sheet of boundary ideal J. And in that, uh, uh, so that largest ideal is precisely such that for that quotient A modulo J, you get the Caesar envelope. And this is, is really very useful because it reduces the, the kind of search uh, for the Caesar envelope to just writing any kind of nice sister extension and trying to find the sheet of boundary ideal J. And in, in some cases, for instance, you could try to find a sister extension of your operator system, which uh, is simple. So there's no uh, two-sided ideals. And then it also doesn't have a sheet of boundary ideal. So you're already already at the sister envelope. So that's uh, that we will encounter in a moment. So, Sorry, Walter, may I have a trivial question, please? Uh, so what's the difference between isometric and completely isometric? 
So completely isometric means that it also respects the uh, say the the the, the, the complete uh, matrix norms. So it's like if what you do is you have mn of e and then you can okay if this mn business okay yeah thanks so it's uh, when i write completely it means i you look at the matrix norms or the matrix order or there were many uh instances of, of the same completely bounded etc so, yes 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 okay. but i never encountered completely isometric yes <laughs> okay so um so the uh, so uh, yeah, nice example here is the uh, continuous harmonic functions on the closed disk. So that sits uh, inside this, this C algebra uh, continuous functions on the closed disk. But if you think about what happens is that if you take the harmonic function, then uh, it will actually take its uh, maximum value, at least in modulus, on the boundary S one. So that's the usual principle one uses. And that would be exactly the isometry I'm after, which means I can just kind of quotient out the interior of the disk or C0 of the interior, meaning that uh, what I'm left with is C of S1. So that's my sheet of boundary is S1. And um, so uh, the ideal would be C0 of the open disk, right? So that's- uh, So I'm, I'm having problems reading your penultimate sentence. Then by the maximum modulus principle, the shield of boundary is yeah. ah, by max. Okay, okay, okay. Sorry. Using yes, the I, maximum yes. modulus principle, we yeah. find that the shield of boundary is, is just yeah. S1. Yeah. And this means that the Caesar envelope is C of S1. Yeah. So this this is different from what you may uh, expect uh, if you if you start with it. It's also an honest uh, operator system example. I mean, you could mm -hmm. do this for holomorphic functions on the closed disk as well, and that's mm -hmm. a pretty space case. Uh, example uh, with the same result, but here you really are in this operator system context where you have that uh, that, that, that that envelope um, to be seen yes, as one. I was just missing the commas. Sorry. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So that's um, um, what happens there. So let's now introduce a measure. So this is in the first paper uh, in CMP. Um, the, uh, a measure to to see how far away are we from this uh, from a Caesar algebra, and we want to associate this to an uh, an operator system. So for that, what I will do is I look at uh, what I call E not n. So I take just products uh, up to degree n, and then uh, I take linear combinations of such. And whenever I hit a Caesar algebra, I would say that's my propagation number. And now I do this in the uh, kind of the invariant way. So I, I, of course, I could indicate which um, Caesar extension one takes, but I take the Caesar envelope, right? So I, I map A, so E into the Caesar envelope, and I look at whenever it happens that uh, that pro these products, the smallest integer n, such that these products up to uh, uh, the up to degree n is actually the Caesar envelope. It's a Caesar envelope, a Caesar algebra, sorry. Sorry, is it always finite? Uh, no, it could be infinite. Good okay. question. Mm -hmm. So we allow this for, to be infinity. And actually there will be examples where this is the case. And um, so uh, for the harmonic function, something interesting appears is that if you think what happens, I mean, so I could say, well, Let's, um, so what could be the map from these harmonic functions to the circle? Well, as I just said, it's just restriction because I quotient out everything on the interior. Um, so I restrict to the circle, but then actually you realize that uh, that's uh, also, uh, that, that, that's, uh, that, that, that's giving you everything because of the fact that you could go back and forth between harmonic functions on the closed disk and actually boundary values Precisely because I'm trying to solve a Laplace equation. So there's a, just a solution given by the Poisson kernel to go from this C of S1 to harmonic functions on the closed disk. So they're actually really the same thing uh, if you look at them as an operator system. So this means that the propagation number is equal to one in this case. And uh, well, some properties. So first of all, the propagation number is invariant on a complete order isomorphism. Well, that's not uh, too surprising. Uh, but it's uh, it's a bit stronger than that. It's uh, also invariant under stable equivalence, uh, which means tensoring, so the minimal tensor product with the compact operators. Uh, so this is this prop uh, E is prop of E tensor K. And this is actually then 
the same as saying it's uh, invariant under Morita equivalence. And this was shown uh, uh, more recently that there, there is this notion of Morita equivalence. Um, and and uh, this is Lefterakis, Kakariadis, and uh, Todorov in, in, um, in, in this paper that appeared uh, slightly after we put this, uh, this out. So there's this notion of Morita equivalence, which really captures exactly this. And uh, a master student of mine, Ian Cote, he showed that uh, there's also this compatibility uh, with tensor products. So there's, of course, many things one can try to investigate. And one of the things is this, that if you take a minimal tensor product of two operator systems, what is then the propagation number is then the maximum, as you would expect. But of course, there's some work to do, especially in finding the sister envelope of a minimal tensor product of two operator systems. All right, so that's uh, kind of uh, this, this measure saying how far away are we from a sister algebra, which we can associate to any operator system. I have a question, stupid yeah. question. So at the very beginning, you said that you could start uh, uh, with a sister algebra and then a projection and cut down everything to the subspace. Okay, and then get an operator system. Now, uh, can, could you relate properties of the projection to this uh, propagation number? here no and i will show you an example so we can just see how it works and actually it seems completely unrelated so that's a very i mean for the finite resolution uh, case there it is true that there's this geometric information that you can kind of understand with this propagation number but for the spectral projection is different and i will show you uh, in a moment uh, how this works if you can wait uh, for that then because i will show you an example where it does not even depend on the uh, the, the rank of the spectral projection So uh, before coming to that, so this is an example, um, uh, which is, is the case of the circle. Let's, um, let's look at, um, at the state spaces because we would like to understand distances. And here I, um, I just use the fact that um, if you have a cone of positive elements, I can still speak of, uh, of states. So what I did for Caesar algebra still makes sense for operator systems because they, I can talk about positive linear functionals of norm one, just as for Caesar algebra. So that's kind of the, the great um, uh, feature of operator systems that we will be using. And uh, for that, we actually use the following. So which works particularly well in the finite dimensional case, you can, could consider the dual operator system which is just a dual vector space. And the dual structure is precisely those functionals which kind of are positive in this sense. And of course that extends to the matrix order. So there's also a matrix order structure on this, uh, on this dual. And uh, this actually is used by Choi and Efros. And um, there's the usual things. So it's, it's in the finite dimensional case, it really works well. And you can imagine that in the infinite dimensional case, one has to work harder to make this uh, clear and what we really mean by the dual. But for now, let's use this only in the finite dimensional case because the duality allows me to kind of transfer uh, information or something I would like to know on E, for instance, pure states. I could understand them by, if I could understand the extreme rays in the dual, uh, in, the, in the cone of positive elements in the dual. And the other way around. So sometimes it's it's you know more about the dual operator system, and then you can just read off from there what are the pure states on E. So there's a very good understanding because of this duality. Okay. So um, yeah, as I said, this is more subtle in the infinite dimensional case, but uh, this will come later. So let's come to uh, uh, your ex the example, and then Roberto also to. Uh, to answering your question. So these are kind of the, the, the key example that we take as a sort of a, a guiding example in the, in the first paper is that we look at spectral truncations of the circle. And <clears throat> so spectral truncations uh, for the Dirac operator on the circle just amounts to doing Fourier theory with, um, I would say, N uh, modes. And um, there you find, uh, for instance, this PN, this projection. And so if you have your Hilbert space, finite dimensional, and the most important ingredient is this, uh, this operator system, which you get by compressing C of S1. Now, if you think what happens if you kind of let a function F act on L2 of S1, it's like shifting. Every time you have a Fourier mode uh, EK, it's just a sort of a shift operator. 
uh, what is a shift operator. And if you compress with P, you kind of, uh, well, you only take uh, part of that into account. And in particular, you take this, uh, this you get this tuplets matrix. So it's a finite dimensional tuplets matrix where you have like, uh, meaning you have constant diagonals like T0, it's just the kind of, it's, they're the Fourier coefficients of, uh, of the function F, T0 is just the, the constant and so on. Um, but they're put into this, uh, this, this, uh, this form when you compress with P. So that's the operators uh, that I should be considering. And that's what I denote as um, if C of S1 with an upper N. So that's, and I will refer to it as the Tuplitz operator system. And now, if you start looking for what happens if you um, if you take the Caesar extension that is generated by these Tuplitz um, uh, matrices, it's not too hard to write any matrix actually as a sort of a, a polynomial in Tuplitz matrices. And with that, it, you get to the conclusion that I have a Caesar extension which is M of C. But that doesn't have an ideal and doesn't have a sheet of boundary ideal in particular. So that's my Caesar envelope then. So that's the MNC, that's the kind of the N by N matrices. It also says that I, I should not be considering that Caesar envelope. I should really be focusing on this operator system because the Caesar envelope is not very interesting. It, it, for instance, it doesn't have too much to do with C of S1. So I really should be focusing on this, uh, this tuplets operator system. Also, you find that actually you can sort of optimize how many tuplets matrices do you need to write any matrix. And for that, you need only uh, quadratic terms. So it's only a products of, of degree two, independent of N. So here, I hope that answers your questions is that it doesn't really, it doesn't have anything to do with the, the, the rank of the projection. It's always two, which is somewhat surprising if you think about it, but then you do the computation and it's just there, so. Mm -hmm. All right, so um, yeah, let's um, try to understand the structure a little bit better. And, and <coughs> well, let's, let me introduce the, um, the duality. And um, I consider uh, the dual operator system, which we will call um, fichier reese operator system. So let me first introduce this, uh, this system. So it's denoted C star Z, but now with a lower N which means, and that's kind of this duality that is rather natural, is that I consider uh, functions on S1, but I only take finitely many um, Fourier coefficients into account and all the rest is zero. So I have like a support condition in Fourier space and it's ranging from minus N to N. So that's what the N stands for. And I just say that an element in there is positive if and only if this function is a positive function on S1. So you kind of inherit from C star of Z, the notion of positivity and of complete positivity that, that also applies. But let me just focus on this, uh, this positivity for the moment. So you're taking symmetric uh, windows or? Uh, yes, but um, that's not really, uh, it's, it's actually just any interval of a certain size that would work. Mm -hmm. That's okay. Then um, the, um, the sheet of boundary that you find is, uh, uh, is, is actually, since I'm referring to C star of Z, which is being generated indeed by this, by this C star of Z N. Um, so first of all, you find that there's this C star extension, which is C of S1 or C star of Z. I actually realize that, uh, that there can never be a quotient that you can kind of cancel without losing norm or keeping an isometry when you look at this operator system. And this is not so difficult to see if you think about invariance under rotations. You can not really take out the part of, of S1, some ideal in C of S1, without losing um, uh, some information on the operator system. And in fact, uh, so this is the C star envelope, the C star of Z, but you see that the propagation number is infinity in this case. So you cannot, uh, so you just propagate to get to C star of Z eventually, but you need an uh, infinitely many uh, products uh, degree. So the, uh, the structure of this, uh, this operator system can be well understood. So first of all, I find that the extreme rays 
in the these positive uh, these kind of positive elements um, they are given by elements for which uh, this Laurent series so it's like the extension to the complex plane akzk has all its zeros on s1 so that's something to to realize because it later on it will be important for the pure states on the dual system and um, uh, for the pure states actually you realize that uh, that i could just first of all i could of course extend my pure state to a pure state on c of s1 so i know it, it could be evaluation at the at the point of s1 but actually all of them will be realized in this way and that's because again of this invariance on the rotations so that's um which is something i mean uh, typically if you do some kind of uh finite approximation of a space you would lose this kind of uh, symmetry whereas here we we keep that symmetry of rotational invariance uh, for s1 sorry could you please remind me what is the definition of the extreme ray so it's uh what you uh what you consider is um it's it's like with extremal points in a convex space but now i have a scaling included so it's like an extreme point up to scaling mm -hmm. okay is that kind of sufficient i mean mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yes thank you i also have another question yeah go ahead go ahead so like i'm surprised i'm a little bit baffled like by the, how much different they are like i'm mean, like both of them are like uh, continuous functions basically over the torus right uh, like this uh, fair reese operator system and like the previous one but uh, that they have different propagation numbers like one is infinite the other one too and but i didn't really see like how much they are different because both are like basically just like fourier modes right i'm mean, like like finite linear combinations of Fourier modes. Yeah, exactly. So this is a very uh, so it's a very good question. So it's um, the the main point is that they're so they may look similar in the sense that you can have take finitely many um, uh, yes. modes into account, but they're as an operator system they're completely different. So for instance, if you think about positivity, one would be positive in C of S one, whereas the other would be positive as a matrix. So I hope that can sort of yes, yes. Um, I share your uh, surprise in a sense. You feel surprised. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, yeah, because I, I, I feel like I felt like that maybe this is just a how to say a reordering of like uh, which Fourier modes you pick up and like. Uh, could you maybe or could you maybe show again the previous uh, operator system like? Uh, yes, this one. But yes. maybe it's good to realize. I mean, this is a well-known problem. If I would take this. Tuplets, and actually this works for tuplets operators as well. So if I would think about, if I have this as an, uh, this tuplets operator, let's take this finite dimensional one. Yes. And suppose it's positive. Then the challenge is to find uh, a function with the same coefficients, which is still positive. And, and that's just not the same thing. It's not possible to, to find this extension in a sense. I mean, it, you really have to do some work. It's not just like you take the same Fourier modes, and be, since this matrix is positive, my function will be positive. That's not true because the positivity here comes from MN of C. So it's just a matrix uh, thing. And the other one in the dual system would, uh, would be completely different. And in fact, it, this is even uh, true if you, um, and I will come to that in a moment, if you would think about uh, like matrices with a certain structure like, like here, mm -hmm. and, and you would consider the dual system then um, it's like, so do I first impose the, the constraint of this, um, how should I explain it? Well, maybe I just come to that uh, whenever that comes up later on. But I hope this kind of, um, I mean, it's indeed, it's a, it's a good point to kind of. Yeah, I'm just surprised like you. Uh, yeah. Thanks. Okay, so this is that structure. So then, um, well why do you call it Feye? Uh, yeah, here comes the explanation. You're well uh, well timed. <laughs> because these guys, they are uh, Feye and Reese. Uh, well, two of them. So, um, so uh, there's this duality, as we just discussed uh, already. Uh, so it's really there. And the duality is just kind of given by, by this kind of, uh, what is the usual pairing that you would do, for instance, if you do Feye theory. 
and it's very similar to free a theory so that's very nice it's the same formula but now i take the the the, the kind of the diagonals of the triplet matrices and then i pair them to the free coefficients of this uh, this uh, fejeri operator system and so what we did in our paper was we showed that it's actually a duality uh, respecting the order structure so if i want to say what is positive I could use the duality to characterize positivity of one or the other in terms of the dual system. But uh, for the matrix order, we really left this behind. And um, this was done by Ferenic. But the key lemma is uh, called Fejeri's lemma. So uh, uh, actually, both of them were responsible for this, uh, this lemma, which tells me something about if I have um, a function which is, is positive, uh, suppose uh, so, so that's on a, on a circle, for instance, and, and uh, uh, then I would like to say, can I write that as a as a modulus square? Then you could argue maybe with some Caesar algebra machinery. Uh, yes, you can, uh, but um, but the point is really that what I can do is I with this support condition, I can take a square root in this sense with a smaller support, like half the support. And that's what Fischer-Ries tell me, and that's what's really driving this duality. So here in the picture, uh, on the left, you see uh, what well, Kara Theodori is, is sitting. So he will come back in a moment. Then Fischer is standing there, and uh, Ries is the guy on the right. So they were actually the, the lemma that we use is 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 kind of uh, is is, is uh, proven by them a long time ago, um, and uh, the. Uh, the paper by Ferenic is using the operator valued Fejeri's lemma. So it's the same kind of factorization, but now with operator values. And that's, of course, that you need if you want to deal with uh, matrix order. Now, what, um, what then happens is that, um, that I can now kind of um, harvest from what I just had before. I, I know the pure states on this dual system and on the extreme rays, so I kind of can revert them. So then I conclude that the extreme rays in the um, Tuplitz operator system are given by this kind of rank one uh, um, F lambdas, which include uh, kind of, they're, they, they're like powers of lambdas. It's one lambda, lambda squared, it's one, um, up to power N. And then um, uh, the, the other kind of uh, structure is the pure state space. For this, you realize that I, uh, I, I described the extreme rays in the dual system as being precisely given by these polynomials with, with roots on the circle. So this is completely characterized, of course, by giving you these roots up to ordering. So what I, what I realized is that my pure state space is, is just a torus Tn, these n numbers on the circle, where I don't care about the ordering, so it's modulo permutation group Sn. And, and that's kind of uh, what we were trying to understand is what is the kind of the, what are the points in a sense of this operator system, which we got by truncating my my circle, spectrally truncating my circle. Excuse me, may I have a kind of a stupid question? Go ahead, go ahead. Because <laughs> here uh, we have the duality of C S one N and C star Z N. Mm -hmm. But if I remember correctly, in the C star Z N, we take the uh, symmetrical window around zero. Yeah. But in the definition of CS1N, we only take the functions with positive indexes. Now, C of S1, let me show you, because it's like uh, it's upper diagonal and lower diagonal. And it would also run in the same way. So they would have negative. Um, so it's maybe let me show you. So here. So it's T1 up to Tn minus 1 below the diagonal, and T minus 1s are the, are the kind of the, the, the entries above the diagonal. The, uh, what, what I, I was confused because you had the orthogonal projection onto space ah, of sure. E1 up to EN. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and uh, that's, that's why I got confused. Yeah, so it, it, that's a very good point. So even though I take that as a starting point, that's only Hilbert space. When I compress, uh, I could still map this EN, it could map to E1, right? So this means I also have uh, the, the, the Fourier coefficients of f, uh, which are degree uh, minus n plus 1. OK. You see what I mean? Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for the question.
Oh yeah, so uh, Karate Adori, I, I promised you that he would uh, kind of enter because um, actually this, um, let me go back one slide so to show you what I'm talking about. So this is this, this, this uh, rank one uh, extreme ray, this gamma lambda. It's given by a, a number lambda or a, an element lambda in S1. And so what this tells me is that from there, I could conclude that if I take a positive uh, operator, uh, <clears throat> a, a positive uh, tuplet uh, matrix, so a top, uh, positive element in C of S1n, then of course it decomposes as kind of positive linear combinations of these extreme rays. And this is precisely an odd result of Kata Theodori which tells me that if I take this T tuplet matrix positive, then I can kind of factorize it, uh, where I have this delta, these are the, the kind of the positive um, elements that, that give you the combination. And then these V is built up from these rank one operators and you just take linear combinations. And this you can kind of re-establish by looking at this, um, this result. And in fact, uh, this duality uh, can also be used, uh, that was actually done by Ferenic to show that um, that positivity, um, uh, if you take a positive uh, linear map of the n by n complex matrix matrices, that is actually completely positive when you restrict it to the tuplet operator system. <coughs> There's also something about embedding these tuplet matrices into the algebra of n by n mat complex matrices. That's really it's always uh, it's the same map all of the time. So it's just up to conjugation. It's always the same up to base chains. Okay, so let's uh, give you an example. So uh, n is equal to three before dealing with actually the kind of the other direction where n goes to infinity. So for n is equal to three, we're talking about uh, three by three tuplet matrices. It's the simplest case in a sense. And um, so they're of this form. And um, so you may wonder, first of all, okay, we know that uh, for this case, the pure state space is given by two points on a circle and in fact it's a, it's concretely given like this and i mean again you could do this by hand if you think about what do i have i have matrices a uh, certain collection of matrices i take a pure state on there which i can extend to the three by three matrices so i know for sure it's a vector state but i have to find which one uh, do i get i mean what is my pure state space and it's precisely these ones which are parameterized by two points x and y um, where I do not care about the ordering and they're of this form. So they're given like that. And uh, that's related to finding these, these, these roots to lie in the circle, but that's, that's not so relevant. Um, but what do you get if you, if you would uh, kind of maybe plot some projection of the second and the third component? It looks like this. So this is also for amusement. So it's, um, but also to, to understand the structure, the, the rich structure already that we have is that this is the shape that you get. And um, if I indeed take two points on a circle uh, up to a permutation, uh, this is just a maybe strip. So that's kind of the structure of the state space that you get, this orbifold structure you get um, in a sense um, in this very simple case. Or if, uh, you mean Mo Mobius strip or maybe Klein battle? No, it's a maybe strip. So it has a boundary, yes? Yes, the circle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is a boundary. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's this a blue thing actually that you see over there. Yeah, it's um, just a circle, yes. Yeah. Okay. Like, okay, uh, okay. So in that sense, it's really a maybe a strip, and not like uh, something like uh, with with uh, with our vi fibers, but but really kind of. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. it, yeah. As the picture mm -hmm. should suggest, I mean, it's like what I what I plotted down here is like the um, it's T two modulo the permutation S two. And then you realize that that's uh, that you can kind of recut and paste. That's what what my picture is suggesting here, and to get the maybe a strip, in the usual sense. I have a, another basic question. Like, go ahead, go ahead. But speak up. Um, so, how do you verify? How does one verify like uh, state spaces? For example, in this case, like. Uh, um, I mean, like, how would you like? How would how would one tackle like uh, this problem? Like. Or finding like pure states on the uh, um, <clears throat> well, operator system. In this context, you mean? Or yes, in yes, yes. But in this context, I use the duality. Uh -huh. I exploit that duality, so I know the dual system. 
Uh-huh. And so that's really powerful because I have control over the extreme rays. I know exactly what I'm looking for. So this information is used to find the pure state space. Yes, I see. But that's, uh, of course, you can try to do it by hand. Say, well, yes, I did it on this slide. I say, well, it always extends to a pure state but, uh, of, of M3C. But that will, uh, well, it's much uh, less, it's less elegant, first of all. Yes, and it's tedious. It really for... quite this duality, yeah. So you can just like see, okay, but like you know, like the dual, you take the, you know, the dual space, you know how it looks like, and you know what is the, what are the extreme points, and then you're done, right? Like, yeah. Exactly, yeah. You put extreme rays typically, but uh, up to scaling, that's sufficient. And then so you may yes. have some base cone or something like this, but that's that's sufficient, yeah. Okay, yeah, so it's very, very, very elegant then. Mm. Yeah, thanks. Thanks also for the question, so to realize so um yeah so as i said we look uh, at the n is equal to three and then we look at the other direction which is um, say towards infinity and that's something i did in a in another paper and uh Evgen heckelman was my master's student um he worked on this uh, actually anal analyzing the pure state spaces and um so this i will only explain very briefly but the idea is that um that you may wonder how uh, kind of close are these state spaces if you equip them with the metric that I was giving you. So that metric formula still makes sense. Um, even though I have an operator system, I have states, I have this, this Dirac operator, and that is still there. So you may wonder uh, what happens if, if I kind of compare these states. So, so for that, I want to link C of S1 with these tuplet system and for that I compress in one direction of course that's what I already did and what is possible in this case is you can actually go back um, take approximately so what I'm looking for is a is an, an order inverse for which kind of it's not it's an approximation of an order inverse meaning that this composition of R and SN so RN maps CFS1 to the tuplet system and S1 maps it back so that composition, if you compare it to T, it's small, uh, but that's kind of under control with the, 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 the Lipschitz norm. That's what the CC1 stands for, the Lipschitz norm of T. And the same applies to uh, the other direction, so SN, RN, which is doing something on a function. And actually, it's possible to just compute what it is. It's, it's the convolution with the Fichet kernel. So we're really kind of in good shape if you think about this in terms of Fourier theory. So the first one is a sure product on a, acting on a matrix, for which you have to compute the norm. So that's maybe uh, the, the main challenge. For the other one, you have to compute the norm of how the Fichet kernel acts. And that is actually something you do in Fourier theory, where you just try to find that the Fichet kernel is actually a good kernel in the sense that it's an approximation of the identity. Also there, you see that the defect of this being an approximate identity is controlled by the derivative of f, so the Lipschitz norm of f. Um, so, what you can uh, use this for is that you can go back and forth between states. First of all, the state of, uh, of so some state of C of S one, so some probability measure. And uh, what you can do is you can compare it. Um, so, so you have phi and psi. There are these probability measures, and then you can pull them back and compute the distance, but uh, only uh, in terms of the data that is available at that finite uh, truncated level. So that's my dn. So I, I do the computation there, and then I realize I can show that um, the distance between these kind of pullback states is states on the tuplet system is, like, can, is comparable to the distance on S1 between these uh, probability measures. And that could, of course, be Kontorovich uh, distance or uh, uh, con distance between the states, all the variation uh, of Wasserstein, they're all the kind of the same um, uh, formula. Uh, and it tells me how to kind of realize this, uh, how to compare these distances. And this gamma n goes to zero. And now just to confirm, or maybe just to, uh, for, for fun, uh, I did some, uh, I learned some basic Python to, to realize, uh, to compute this distance where you just take some points on a circle, you just compute the distance and you see that indeed, if you take larger and larger matrices, first of all, this gamma N, it goes, uh, what well, gets smaller. 
um, in the university cases of, of size three, five, and nine. Uh, and you find that indeed this distance sits nicely in this in this window. So it approximates the distance, which is the, the acute triangle um, for the circle. But uh, really what is behind this is the, um, the fact that we have this uh, very kind of um, solid uh, control over this composition of RN and SN. Rin, may I have a question? Yes, yeah, sure. Uh, is there a chance that if uh, phi and psi are pure states, then if you pull them back, uh, you also by this SN, you also get pure states? No. So that's not the case. And in fact, um, uh, what happens is, um, and so what you can even show, and this will come in a moment, is that, uh, so first of all, you if you think about what happens, it's like you're, you're smearing um, this point evaluation where you kind of have only finitely many uh, Fourier modes available. Mm -hmm. So this will never be sharp in a sense. Mm -hmm. because for that, you would need infinitely many. And, and so you have this kind of uh, finite uh, idea of resolution already at the spatial level because I only have finitely many Fourier modes. Mm -hmm. but that's crucial in this. Uh, and, and in fact, uh, so if I come to the results, so <clears throat> actually, let me be a little bit shorter on this and only kind of talk about the proposition, leaving this idea of how to compare spaces uh, behind for another occasion, is that you could say that uh, this, if you take the sequence of state spaces uh, with this metric at each level, then you can show it converges to the state space of C of S1, so probability measures in Grom of House of Distance. So as metric spaces, they converge. And um, what Heckelman showed, and it's also an answer to your question, is that if you take the sequence of pure state spaces, so at each finite level you take pure states, then that would already converge to uh, the same state space, so all probability measures on C of S1. So maybe mm -hmm. you weren't asking it in reverse, but what you can actually do mm -hmm. by pure states at each finite level, you can uh, approximate, um, so in Chrome of House of Distance, all probability measures on C of S1, on S1. I see. Mm -hmm. And it's precisely this idea of, 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 of smearing the points by having available only finitely many Fourier modes, essentially. Mm -hmm. All right. So here uh, ends uh, the, say, the first part. So I typically, Piotr, this, um, I have like a half an hour or so. Yeah, we have 28 minutes to be precise, but of course, we have some leniency. <laughs> <laughs> So let's um, let's let's uh, um, look a little bit into these non-unital operator systems, and also get to this uh, this idea of finite uh, resolution. So there's like two things. I mean, I here I will only sketch a little bit on non-unital operator systems, but only to kind of put it into perspective. Also uh, historically, um, what was going on, but then I will work in a very specific context where I'm. It's like almost unital. So I can use almost all of the techniques that I have available and which I need, but just kind of for, kind of for, for also for kind of more general interest, there's this uh, idea of a non-unital operator system. And uh, first of all, since um, we don't have a unit that, that's, that was playing a crucial role, for instance, in getting a norm on an operator system. And that's also how to realize it uh, eventually. But let's start with the matrix ordered operator space now. So operator space meaning it's just a vector space of operators, maybe closed. And the matrix ordered um, uh, is as usual. So you have these cones and um, the additional kind of property of the operator space would be that you have uh, matrix norms. And that's what I indicated here, meaning you have norms from N, M, N of E. <clears throat> then if you think about what can I do with state spaces, of course, that's the first thing to, uh, to understand is that if you're non-unital, then it's not so uh, straightforward. Uh, well, you can define state spaces as usual, of course, normal, <coughs> one, positive. Uh, but then there's this problem that that's typically, uh, in general, that's not always convex. It's not even weakly star compact in general. Uh, whereas the, um, the non-cumulative quasi-state space, so they, they are the ones which, um, which you get if you take um, uh, norm smaller or equal to one, 
they are actually that's actually convex and really star compact. So that seems to be a better one. Um, but okay, it's um, just good to kind of keep this in mind. And you can use that non-commutative quasi-state space to define something which is called a numerical radius, and it's modified only because it acts on these two by two matrices, where you kind of let uh, phi range over all these quasi-states, and then acting on X, or this matrix made from X to make itself a joint, take the modulus of that and then the supremum. So you kind of try to find this, this norm essentially of X, uh, in terms of what the states or the quasi-states do on that. And, and N is also arbitrary, yes? Yeah, yeah. so I uh, know N is actually given by X, but it works for any N. So it's the norm that you get on NN, MN of E. Uh, so N is fixed, yes? Yeah, so yeah. N is fixed, okay. And then this formula is valid for any N. Mm. But that's the, the numerical radius nu E for uh, MN of E. And so here I actually abuse that notation uh, again. So I hope you um, you understand what I mean. So Werner introduced this idea of a non-unital non operator system as a matrix ordered operator space for which that numerical radius is actually what he introduced was uh, the equivalence of the norms. And we take it to be equality, so it's slightly different. Uh, but this also applies for any N. Okay, so all these matrix norms are realized by this numerical radius. Is, that's what we would like to have, and which you, of course, for Caesar algebras for uh, unital operator systems, you would have this because of the units. But it's good to kind of, um, I mean, it's the kind of the starting point of these non-unital systems. So what will we will be using is uh, actually the specific class where we um, were not unital, but as I said, almost unital, and not so much in the multiplicative sense, but in the ordered sense. So for that, I mean, I can always uh, squeeze X uh, into T and minus T and not times the identity that would require the existence of such an identity, but some sort of approximate uh, identity, which is this E lambda. And um, in this case, you could say, well, let me just define a matrix norm by taking the smallest T that you use to squeeze this X in for some E lambda. And of course, if it's unital, then it, this is exactly getting you what you had uh, for operator system or, or Caesar algebra. It's a very well-known formula that you take the infimum of this t for which uh, this x lies in between minus t and t. And um, well, that's actually uh, you mean for all lambdas. For all lambdas. No, for uh, some. So you just need to find one lambda for which that works. Mm -hmm. Here, I take. Um, um, so I'm not sure, maybe, I didn't understand maybe the question. You mean in the infimum? Yeah, I'm a bit confused. I mean, we have this net, right? So you have this big set lambda, which labels uh, elements uh, of your net. Mm -hmm. And now you write an equality. I understand that you're looking for some optimal uh, positive real number T. Yeah. But when you write this inequality, what is your quantifier? Is it for all lambda, for some lambda, or exists some lambda? I'm just a bit confused. No, it's uh, it's over all lambda, and you take the smallest t, yeah. which you can do that. Yeah, that's what I thought. But yeah, this yeah, is sorry. So you can do that. <clears throat> and and then this uh, turns out to be a non-unital operator system, as was shown by Karn and Han, and they will be the ones uh, of interest to us. So, uh, in fact, so what I will refer to this as a matrix norm defining. It's a bit long, but it's uh, it's the idea is that you define the, the norm or the matrix norm using this approximate order unit precisely in this sense of taking this infimum. So this formula holds. Um, so this is the matrix norm defining approximate order units. Some people use some acronym for that, but uh, let me just write it here. So we may uh, then uh, use this to kind of use the usual kind of arguments to find, for instance, norm one functionals, saying that the norm is always attained by what it does on one. Well, we just replace it by saying, well, the norm of phi is attained by what it does on the what it what it, what the limit is of phi on this approximate order unit, and that allows me to show that the non-commutative state space is actually convex, because that property of taking limits is actually linear, so that or uh, so respecting convex uh, convexity. Now, if um, you're in this uh, in this case where um, I have a, a Caesar algebra A kind of surrounding E, it could be Caesar envelope or a Caesar extension. 
uh, and I have a normally defined an approximate order unit for A, which is actually contained in E, then I can use that to extend a, a state to uh, a state on A, uh, where purity is also respected. That argument of extending pure states is then actually, that's also a convex argument actually, uh, for the kind of the set of, uh, of extensions and so on, which is of course well, well known for C structures at least. But that actually uh, applies if you are in this, uh, this situation. And uh, well, then uh, Jordan decomposition uh, uh, can be made to work, which means that I can somehow um, extend positive functionals. Um, well, let, let me phrase it like this. So I can decompose phi in terms of phi plus and phi minus, and in such a way that the norm of phi is actually the sum of the two. And there's no, it's not unique. That would only, only be in the unit of c algebra case, but at least you have this, this property. And eventually what you end up with is that, um, that I can uh, realize the dual of E, and that's of course what I'm after, as a quotient of the dual of A modulo some space, which is kind of uh, nullifying E. So it's kind of the perp of, of E. And that, uh, that here I wrote it for the MNE uh, uh, case. But of course, if you read that, it just means that if I would be interested in the states of E, I could look at the states uh, on A uh, modulo some, um, some subspace. So just trying to understand this, um, this state spaces all of the time. And this applies in this case where I have this, uh, this approximate order units. And while well, there is a subtlety, uh, well, it's actually quite straightforward that it also works if you take dense subspaces E and A <clears throat> because of taking functionals anyways, it doesn't really matter. Okay, so um, let's look at the, uh, the class of examples that I'm interested in, which is uh, coming back to uh, maybe the first slides is this, this idea that I have this distance between two points. So I generalize a little bit but it should be not too much uh, for this audience is, um, is that I take a locally compact groupoid G, but think about the pair groupoid X cross X um, that, that I used in the beginning. And then of course you can, uh, this is just a formula for the C star algebra. Groupoid C star algebra that you associate to this can be defined as soon as I have a higher system. Well, this is uh, nothing uh, really new, but what I would like to do is I want to restrict my support uh, for these, uh, these these continuous functions on G. So for that, I look at um, at omega a bond, which I uh, which I call just a triple G new omega. So there's this higher system, and there's an open symmetric subset omega around the diagonal around the units G zero. And if you take this, then I could take the closure of the subspace which has support precisely on this omega inside the group C structure. And that's the operator system that I'm interested in. And here are some examples. So you can, can realize what we were doing before is actually fitting uh, right into this, uh, this, this framework. So if I suppose I look at C star of Z, so considering Z as a groupoid, um, then I take C star of Z, so the group C star algebra, take the support condition, it's exactly what I call the Fisher-Reese operator system. I could also do that in the cyclic group, so the finite cyclic group, CM. Then I take also that support condition, but then modulo M. Then what you realize is that, so first of all, C star of C M, that would be like circulant matrices. And the support condition just tells me that while well, some of these kind of these diagonals are zero. So they're like banded M by M circulant matrices. Well, this means that, um, that it really depends on what is the, the groupoid that one is considering, irrespective of what omega n one is, one is taking. So it's really important to realize where you are considering these same omega n's. It really depends on, on, on the, uh, the groupoid that, uh, that they lie in. And another case is this one, is that if you take uh, the set x, just of m points, and you take a, a band Rn, which contains the diagonal, if you would take this as a table or so, um, that then you would get banded uh, M by M matrices of a certain bandwidth N. So that's like the circular matrices, but now uh, not circular, but just arbitrary matrices. Okay, so the uh, examples that I have in mind and which I would like to understand is the following. So you take a, a relation R 
there's a tolerance relation, so it's not necessarily transitive. Uh, in x cross x, that's my groupoids. And uh, this is the one that I had in mind uh, and uh, that I showed you before, take x and y with this uh, uh, equivalence, the tolerance equivalence, or tolerance relation, I should say. And um, then we have to, of course, have this harm uh, measure, and that would be given to us if we take x to be a measure space. Uh, then if we take r to be this open subset, such as the one I wrote down in the box, I get this operator system ER. So note that um, this is actually part of the compact operators because they would be the integral operators or the C term for the, for the pair groupoids. So which is already quite useful for later on because the compacts also have that property of simplicity. Now let's look at uh, an example. So I take a finite set, take uh, the symmetric reflexive relation and actually consider that as a graph. So saying that two points are kind of related if there is an edge uh, connecting them. And suppose that R actually generates uh, all of X cross X. So that means that the graph is actually connected. There are no vertices left out. Then you can realize the Caesar envelope of ER precisely as the compacts, because you can reach that, uh, that, that the whole compact uh, operators. So all of the Caesar algebra. And also the propagation number is precisely the diameter of R. So what do you have to kind of, how many uh, edges do you have to cross to reach any vertex from another vertex? And for the pure states, we find that uh, they have also that property. Of course, they are vector states because this lies in the compacts where there is a support condition on these vectors. And the support condition is that there is not uh, a gap between that supports, between the supports of V, which is kind of larger or cannot be bridged by that relation. So that's the idea of this R connectivity. So there's kind of very concrete uh, kind of description of these, uh, of these pure states here as well, which will be useful later on if we try to tackle this R epsilon. So to get from R epsilon to finite sets, we use a technique um, which is based on uh, finite partitions. So we just partition X in, in pieces UI, which are disjoint measurable sets, such that the diameter is small enough and uh, we take a direction of such partitions by refinement. So it's a smaller UI essentially. And um, if I think what, what would be the, the final dimensional algebra AP corresponding to that, that would be actually the compacts of L2 of P, but I realize them as kind of uh, using these indicator functions, uh, one on U and one on V, and just kind of using all of the U and the V which are in this partition. So that's my matrix. And if I take a tolerance relation R epsilon, I just say that, uh, well, U times V is in that relation R epsilon. If U times V is precisely within this, this range R epsilon. So it's in this R epsilon P is first of all U and V are in the partition and their product will lie in the relation R epsilon. And that's my sort of uh, approximation eventually for E R epsilon using these finite partial partitions of the of the metric space x and uh well as i said the refinement is uh, is like this uh, it's respected by just inclusion as one could uh, expect but this is really something that that helps me to drive eventually that um uh, that that direct limit so to get to the, the the space that i'm interested in so here you see that first of all ap is just unital so there's a unit in this, uh, this matrix algebra. And that unit will be, of course, an, an, an order unit for, uh, for, this, uh, for AP, but also for E of RP because it sits in there. And it becomes an approximate order unit if I take a direct limit. And that's the one that will drive the understanding for the state spaces. All right, let me skip this. So since uh, lack of time, let me get to these um, kind of conclusions. So first of all, I have this, um, uh, the, the, the thing of interest is that I have a, a metric measure space with the additional property that it's a path metric space, meaning that, that I can actually uh, use the usual kind of idea of, of uh, making a geodesics essentially to, to measure distances. Um, and the measure is a full support, so I don't kind of lose uh, subsets uh, by just taking their uh, kind of the indicator function, for instance. 
Um, then what I find is that, uh, first of all, if I look at this direct limit, that's an algebraic direct limit of all these operator systems that you get by looking at finite partitions, then that's actually a dense subspace of the operator system associated to the relation R epsilon, which I was trying to understand. Uh, the same applies to this A epsilon, which is the algebraic direct limit of AP. So that's a dense star subalgebra of now the Caesar algebra, compacts. And um, the, the uh, units, and actually the order units for each of these finite dimensional algebras, that will actually give my, my net of, uh, of approximate order units. And that's actually matrix norm defining, uh, since it actually sits in this compact, which is contained in my direct limit E R epsilon. So these will be kind of my, my dense subspaces, this, this calligraphic E inside the operator system I'm trying to understand. Now, what then happens is that if I take um, X to be, uh, uh, well, some, some additional assumptions complete, locally compact path metric measure space with a measure of full support, things one would naturally need. Then first of all, the Caesar envelope of, um, of, of this operator system E of R epsilon, that would be the compacts. Actually, that's just kind of dragging this support uh, uh, further and further away until you get to all of X cross X. If I consider this, this R epsilon, and that's really using this, this notions of path metric uh, measure spaces uh, a lot. Um, and then you can think, okay, when does that happen? So when do I get there? It's uh, that propagation number. Actually, what you can show is that, uh, that if I take like products E R epsilon times E of, uh, of another uh, R epsilon prime or so, then that would be kind of the same as having E of R epsilon plus epsilon prime. So you can really kind of this support will grow and you will hit of course uh, all of the compacts uh, whenever you get to the diameter of X. So the propagation number is precisely the diameter of X modulo the epsilon. So that's something which is for instance, uh, it's, it's not, uh, not two. So it really depends on the geometric situations whereas for the spectral truncations, which are somehow dual, uh, which we did for the circle, of course, it, we cut two all the time. But here, even for the, um, for the circle, it would just be the diameter divided by epsilon. So it really depends on epsilon. And uh, of course, you take some integer part to get the propagation number. So the roof is here, as you could expect. And then, uh, well, about these pure states. So what you find there is that, um, that, that so the phenomenon is the following. So you'll have, this operator system sitting inside the compacts. I'd like to understand the pure states of this operator system. So I extend them to pure states on the compact operators, which I understand very well. But now the question is, so when um, is this, uh, when are such vector states, psi, psi, when are they still pure if I restrict them to the operator system? And what can actually happen is the following. So uh, since my support on the kernels in E R epsilon is restricted to lie in this R epsilon. It could happen that um, that my vector state psi has support say here and then at some other point where there is a gap which has diameter larger than epsilon. So that means that the operator system cannot really kind of um, jump from one to the other, and it would just this vector state would just split in two vector states. So it's a, it's a complex combination then of the kind of the support on one and the support on the second component. Uh, and, and that means it's not pure anymore if you restrict it. So that condition, so to avoid that, so to find exactly the vector states which are still pure in the operator system, for that we introduce this notion of being epsilon connected, which means, means that if you take the uh, relation R epsilon and if you restrict it to the support of psi, then that relation should generate the full equivalence relation. So you should be able to kind of propagate with this R epsilon or to generate with R epsilon uh, restricted to the support, the full equivalence relation. And that's what the notion of uh, being epsilon connected, which is precisely the one I uh, showed to you before in the finite, uh, finite set case. But it's, it's actually a consequence of that using these partitions. So behind this, the techniques of these, uh, these uh, finite partial partitions is really used or to get this, uh, this um, approximate order units, but also to understand the structure of the pure state spaces. All right.
I think that's um, that's it from my side. So uh, thanks for your attention. Thank you so much. Yep. And now we can continue with our questions. Anybody would like to begin? Well, I know it's your paper, so I think you. <laughs> you know no, I, 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 I don't think I want to to intervene. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah. Uh, I mean, there are plenty of things related to this stuff. I mean, you know, it's uh, it's really quite uh, interesting. Mm. So, any questions, anybody? I'm looking for raised hands. Tomek, how about you? You need to unmute? Yes. Yes, yes I'm unmuted. Uh, could you come back to, uh, to this description of, of this um, what was this? It was about this TN divided by SN, this mm -hmm. quotient of the torus by the symmetry group. Mm -hmm. Let me get there. It looks very, very basic. For instance, here? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So these are pure states. That's right, yeah. Uh, can you say something about uh, the interpretation that this is in the right hand side can be interpreted as as multi subsets of of cardinality, cardinality not exceeding n of 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 a, uh, of a torus. That's right. Uh, can you see something about uh, multiplicities in this uh, multi -sets? Because there are some points which are uh, fixed points of some subgroups. So they are distinguished among uh, generic ones. Mm. So I would take a view from the kind of the thing we're trying to um, approximate, which is S1. Yeah. So the way I would interpret this is that you kind of end up with a, a probability measure uh, on S1. And, and if you would accumulate points, it would just have a higher weight at these points. Mm -hmm. um, of course, one can try to use the, the structure of SN, but it's really just that you have these points and uh, you just take some, some combination of them, for, uh, for instance, to uh, evaluate or to, to understand that these points as, uh, as, as weights uh, on the circle or points with a certain weight uh, for which you get the probability measure. But I'm not sure if that's what you're after. Yes, because... Uh... I have a problem with, with this because on the left hand side you have some pure states. Yeah. So usually pure states uh, are of multiplicity one in a sense. But now you can have on the right hand side some some points of of a higher multiplicity. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So so there's a difference between the notion of a pure state in the sense of al sister algebra. And a pure, a pure uh, state in the sense of uh, the operator system. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. but okay, that's reality. Okay, uh, thank you very much. I have a second question. Uh, what happens to uh, entropy if you if you have, for instance, you have a circle uh, and you have some probability distribution? You can compute uh, the entropy of the radon nicodym derivative. Mm -hmm. of this density with respect to the hard measure on S1. Mm -hmm. uh, what happens uh, under this approximation? Can you see this uh, measure of impurity of the state on the left-hand side, on the side of uh, approximation by, by the states of this, of this finite resolution? Yeah, so this is an excellent question. So uh, in fact, uh, Rui Dong, I'm not sure if he's around, but he's my postdoc and he's exactly trying to understand if you could use entropy, Yes, case. Such a measure. So I'm not sure if he wants to say something here, but but at least that's the idea that um, that's exactly that's what you're saying is is exactly right. I mean, you try to find. So, for instance, if I would take a pure state uh, at this truncated level, could I say something about uh, do I have what kind of what amount of information do I have compared to, for instance, the point on the circle? So that's that's exactly the the kind of the task. 
but it's in progress so in progress not published even on archive okay thank you very much adam your hand is raised uh, yes i have a very basic question since i I don't know whether I understood it correctly. So for a circle, you have this procedure of taking a spectral projections and cutting with the spectral projections. And if you consider a dual system, it's uh, an operator system, it's isomorphic to this uh, last system, which was described using this finite resolutions. Um, no, no, that's not the case. So <clears throat> the dual system of the triplets would be this one where you take like a, a support constraint, so this one, on C star Z, mm -hmm. which is not like a support constraint in the space. So actually, mm -hmm. that's what we first try to understand is whether there's a relation between this triplet operator system and something in which you kind of restrict the support in this kind of uh, groupoid sense, or this this these integral kernels, whether they're related, but. And then we, uh, so uh, there was this invariant that really kind of uh, made us conclude that, uh, that they're completely different because for these tuplet system, there will always be two. Whereas if you take this diameter with the support condition, it would really vary with epsilon. So at least from that perspective, they're not the same and not even up to a Murit equivalence. So in fact, you have three different notions, yes? Yeah, or even more. Spectral projection, you can take a dual system and also you can take this finite resolution. And somehow, it, we expect that if you let the spectral projections, uh, you allow uh, n goes in, to infinity. And on the other side, you uh, you let uh, epsilon goes to, to zero. Mm -hmm. You would get something in the limit, which is isomorphic. I don't know. Is yeah, so this is, uh, at that side, we're much less kind of, uh, so there's this chrome of house of convergence. It's not so clear because it's not so clear what spectral triple you would put on these kernel operators. So this um, C star, group or C star algebra side. But you could try something with uh, what people usually do. So that's also some projects that uh, are under considerations. We, because also there, the duality is not so clearly kind of, not so sharp as here. Also because it's infinite dimensional. But for some cases, and I showed you, that I skipped over them, but they are here. So what you see is if I would take, um, sorry for this there, they may be here. So what you find is that, um, that if you would take an interval, for instance, and we take finer and finer partitions, then first of all, if you think about what this means, you have these kind of uh, partitions, that's these P elements, and the algebra that I'm considering is then P by P matrices. And uh, if I say I have a relation between one partition and the next one, and maybe the, the second one as well, so up to some epsilon window, then I get into bent matrices, where, where the rest would be zero, because that's the support constraint on this, uh, this, this P by P matrices. So that's what you get as, a, as an operator system. Now you may wonder, okay, so what happens if I uh, if I can let that p go to infinity and then eventually maybe epsilon to zero or something like this? Whether that approximates the original kind of uh, space uh, on the consideration, but this is not so clear. So it's um, uh, one of the things here is that if I would say positivity of E p n, that's just saying well my band matrix is positive as a, as a matrix, but the dual system is uh, the positivity is, is as follows. It's saying that, well, my, uh, it's still something like a band matrix. So I have like uh, these, these, I know that there are some, some kind of band on which I know what to put, but it's some, some kind of partially defined matrix, for which everything uh, which is not in this band is not specified. And what you actually have as a positivity is that there is some, entries in there which make the matrix positive this this is because of the quotient essentially i mean that there should be some it's, it's like if you want to put an order structure on the quotient it's not so straightforward what to do because it's uh we take the induced order structure but it, this amounts to saying there is one matrix for which that is positive one extension for which is positive so this means that the dual is is why well, it's understood. It's another project uh, in progress as well, uh, but that makes it difficult to understand the the state spaces and the convergence eventually. 
-hmm. but it I so a short um, answer would be uh, this is all kind of uh, under consideration and we need to better understand how these uh, these finite these, these approximations these finite resolution actually converges and corresponds to the one that you do in in Fourier uh, space mm -hmm. so at this moment it is open yes yeah Mm. Is it clear? It's not the same thing. So, in the sense of, it's not the same operator system. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Adele, por favor. Okay, I have actually a curiosity. If you take your um, take the Fourier mode of the circles and you truncate, now there is a structure there which is a non-associative algebra. Namely, I just take a finite number of modes, then I multiply and I project every time. Mm -hmm. So there is an unassociative algebra there, a structure. Has anyone considered that? Because I, uh, it's something which comes uh, natural after a truncation. Also, if you truncate the um, Fourier, the um, spherical harmonics, and then you multiply, then you can project everything which is above a certain level. Fuzzy sphere solves the problem by doing fuzzy harmonics and doing the fuzzy sphere, but there is a possibility of a non-associative algebra. And I have never seen anybody looking at this structure, but it's not. What do you mean? So I much. mean, so Federa, I think, you, so you wrote a paper with Johnny, right? Uh, where you? We, 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 we doubled something in this direction. So no, yes, no. with Johnny and Francesco. Yeah. But uh, I, I'm just wondering if there is, we, we looked at the literature a little bit, but now it's, it's a, there is a bigger audience. Uh, uh, there is a, there is some structure there. Non-associative algebra is something which I don't know very much. I'm coming from quantum mechanics, I I like to have operators, and operators need to be associative. But there are people, string people, looking at non-associative algebras. There are some beautiful structures there. I don't know very much. There is not only Ottonians in non-associative algebras. But so I was wondering whether someone has looked at it uh, from this point of view, apart from some things that uh, we did, but mm -hmm. we were still in the positive operator value. So the, our paper is, is not so non-associative, doesn't really look at the structure of non-associative, but uh, if, if no one has looked at it, then uh, uh, take it as an invitation to myself as well to look into the structure. <laughs> Yeah, I think so. I'm not aware of this, and uh, so I, I yeah. Would I Am comment? I to go ahead? Yeah. Uh, I have a comment to the last question. Uh, it is somehow related with this, with your example, uh, when you are projecting onto harmonic functions. Uh, namely, if you consider the Hodge decomposition and you have the projection onto harmonic forms, then such projections um, define A infinity structure. So it is um, A infinity structure on differential forms up to uh, the coherent system of higher homotopies. So, so in, in, a, in a very similar situation, you have something like a generalization of an associative structure it is called a infinity structure. So maybe, maybe if if your projection could be interpreted as projection in some in some um, Hodge um, structure, then then, then it, it 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 could be realized as something homotopically associative. Mm. Okay. So this is my comment to to, to, to this question. Comment to the comment. <laughs> Anybody else? I don't. Oh, Adam, go ahead. Yes, I have one more question. So, uh, how all this theory is related to the theory of deformations, deformations quantizations? Is the idea rough idea, uh, having in mind the interpretation, physical interpretation of all this stuff, could be that we look on the space with finite resolution, but if we are probing the space with uh, higher and higher energy, the more non-commutative space uh, appears. So is this somehow related? So um, I only know that at the sort of the technical level, so I have a 
PhD student, Tim van Nuland, who's actually defending tomorrow. But okay, that's not so relevant for you because it will be in Nijmegen. But it, the point is that he um, he tries to quantize uh, a C star algebra, but he, um, uh, he he achieves that by by looking at operator systems um, in this exactly the sense that you're describing, and define the quantization map there, and then to eventually come back to the C star algebra level. So in a sense, I mean that's just uh, it's it's funny that you mentioned this because it's uh, it's it's used precisely in this same kind of philosophy whether philosophically physically speaking it's um, maybe also kind of you can you could argue but it's it's less clear maybe at that point but, uh, let, let me let me make a remark i i hope i won't be interrupted because my my connection is extremely bad i mean i just want to point out the potential link with what was said about homotopy higher homotopy and so on so what happens is the following. What happens is that when you try to do homotopy theory for uh, uh, simplicial complexes, which are not can complexes, then what happens is that the way you would define homotopy naturally doesn't give you an equivalence relation. It gives you a tolerance relation. And so, I mean, this means that when you are dealing with homotopy theory in a wider sense, where you don't stabilize and so on to obtain can complexes, then you land absolutely naturally in this framework of tolerance relations. So I think, you know, this, and in fact, I mean, on my side, it was a very important motivation in order to develop this theory, because somehow, you know, there are um, quite important examples of um, uh, natural simplicial complexes, which are not can complexes. And, uh, and then you want, for instance, to define the homotopy groups, the pi n and so on. And what you find out is that you, you fall exactly on this issue of like understanding the quotient of a space by a relation, which is not an equivalence relation, but which is a tolerance relation. So, I mean, abstractly, this is a very, very important general motivation for this development. Thank you so much. <laughs> Let me see if there are still any raised hands. Ludwig, yes, you want to speak? Ludwig? Okay, sorry. Okay, thanks. No. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, we cannot hear you. <laughs> Ludwig, where is... No, Tomek, it's Tomek again. Yes, go ahead. <laughs> I have another question. Uh, could you go to the page when you are generalizing uh, your construction to groupoids? Sure. So this is the usual groupoids definition. And yeah. This is the... mm -hmm. That's the kind of the support on this omega that we kind of yeah. Uh, did you try? Did you try action groupoids of uh, groups, uh, discrete groups uh, with uh, um, a distinguished set of generators, sure. and then uh, the mer uh, the, the um, uh, metric uh, word uh, word word length uh, metric yeah. yes. Uh, what happens then uh, to this um, approximation in terms of of <laughs> geometric group theory? Uh, it's, a, it's a very good question. So it's uh, indeed this is all open, and uh, I think it's also open uh, for for anyone, of course, to to analyze this. You mean you don't have a student yet working on it? <laughs> no. <laughs> well, I have students, uh, but it's very good. To kind of this, this is waiting to be kind of be further developed. The connection is, is fading. But thanks for this. I mean, it's uh, yeah. okay. Thank you very much. Okay, guys, I think that it's time to wind it up. I'm scrolling again, but I don't see any further questions or comments. I have just one very mild one. Uh, you were talking a lot about the circle. What if you would use some different manifolds? I know a sphere, whatever. Yeah, so for that, I do have a student. <laughs> <laughs> I knew it, I knew it. <laughs> so I had, um, 
a master student first who tried to do this for Tori, okay? Uh -huh. so, uh, and then, um, so what we, so then you can kind of, uh, so say, well, there's just a couple of circles uh, taking it together and you take tensor products and that actually works. So if you kind of do a spectral truncation, which is sort of like a, a box truncation. So you kind of put, uh, so Fourier modes up to a certain N. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes. All direct. yes. However, that's not really what you would like because you would like a spectral projection for the Laplacian or the mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that's more like spherical. So you need like a sphere and you have to kind of estimate something within that sphere. So of course you could try to understand this system and that, that's, that's all right, you can understand, but this, this of hausdorff convergence is really uh, quite a, an issue. So it's, it's not straightforward at all, even though for mm -hmm. the square situation it is. For this one, it's it's much more complicated, and it has to do with all kinds of properties of kernels, Fizet kernels, on on tori and higher dimensional tori. So that's uh, that's something, yeah, a very good point. And maybe the sphere is even easier in a sense. Aha, aha. Not the fuzzy, of course, because we do spectral tr uh, truncation, so it's different, uh, but closely related, I guess. Yeah. But, uh, okay, that's why I asked this question because of the fuzzy sphere. Yeah. yeah. Okay. It seems like it's a never-ending story, Adam. Uh, so yes, it's, it was precisely uh, my question. So do you, do you expect that uh, for this uh, manifold for which there is a construction of something like a fuzzy version of this manifold, it would be easier to obtain such results? No, but no, actually this is, the truncation is different. So if you use spherical harmonics, like with fuzzy spaces, you get, you keep algebras, mm -hmm. like matrix algebras, right? So, and that's really different here. So, and in fact, if you do a spectral truncation, then typically you would not get that. So, for instance, the fuzzy sphere would be just the endomorphisms of all of the kind of the, the irreducible representations. And then you're ending up with matrix algebras that eventually uh, allow you to kind of capture C of, uh, of S2. That's also in the Chrome of Hausdorff sense of Mark Riefel. Mm -hmm. But uh, here we truncate uh, in a different sense. So, the spectral truncation, which really makes a difference. And you don't project onto um, uh, matrix algebras. So it doesn't really help each other. Even though this, the, the structure is very similar. So in this paper, um, where I do this Gram of Hausdorff convergence, I could, uh, along the same lines, prove that uh, or reprove that, uh, reestablish these fuzzy spheres, uh, that they, they would converge to the sphere by just using this notion of this approximate order isomorphism. But other than that, it's just a, a completely different kind of uh, system. So, so which properties of the manifolds uh, you believe that would be crucial for proving such results for this convergence and so on? Yeah, so it appears that it's, uh, so I was actually uh, expecting for the tori that it should at least work, but here we seem to be bound to some dimension uh, of the tori for which it will work, which has to do with the properties of the kernels that you get by doing the spectral truncation. And mm -hmm. so it's, uh, I was, that's quite surprising actually. So even though it's a negative result, it's also in a sense positive that it seems to be much more complicated. So we need uh, maybe other techniques. So I, um, yeah, um, right now I'm, uh, I'm not so sure about which. Uh, so, so this is not something which is uh, geometric in nature, but rather functional uh, analysis. Yes? Right, yeah. And typically you would like to have something like a transform like Bayesian transformation or, or Fizier, they consider this, this convolution to have these kernels, that really makes it work. Mm -hmm. And so that could give you some idea of why things could work. And uh, so that's what would be used for fuzzy spheres. That's exactly the Bayesian transform and the symbol to go back and forth. Um, but, but uh, and, and the Fizier kernel and this, um, that also works in the same way. So there it works. So if you have that available and you can kind of uh, write it in terms of these, uh, these, these, these maps, these RN and SN, then you may be in good shape. But other than that, I have no more kind of property of the manifolds or some kind of mm -hmm. symmetric property that, that you could use. No. Okay, thank you. Thank you. That's very interesting. Thanks. Okay, and with this optimistic comment, I think it's time to wind it up. Uh, let's thank Walter again for a very exciting talk. Yeah, thank you so much. Lots, uh, and uh, let me stop recording. Yeah, I still have my clapping hands. So I stop recording.